Amen. Yeah, praise the Lord. It's radio, radio. All right, uh, Genesis chapter 6. Let me pull up. There we go. There we go. Uh, I'm going to show you something interesting. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. First, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray for my daughter Courtney and her son Liam. Liam is a cool kid. He really is. I love him to death. And he's just so full of excitement and joy. And uh, just pray for him. Uh, he's got a bad, bad situation uh, in his dad's house. And uh, just needs a lot of prayer there. All right. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, tonight. And just thank you, God, for all these people that have come out to your house to worship you. And Lord, we're here to study. We're here to learn. We're here to, uh, uh, to, to lean on this old King James Bible. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would open it up to our hearts and our eyes, Lord, and help us to see things we never saw before. Help us, dear God, to, um, uh, to, Lord, to just have a hunger and a thirst for the righteousness that is in this book. And you promised, Father, that you would fill that hunger, you would fill that thirst. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would uh, just have mercy upon us all. Lord, all of us, Lord, in various ways are unclean, we're undone. Uh, we are hopeless without you. We just pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would uh, just bless each and every one of us tonight and teach us from your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. So let's read it there. You have it up on the screen, but I also want you to look at it in your Bible so you can make a note. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? Angels. Uh, in a very friendly way, is there anybody here who does not believe that they were angels. It's okay to raise your hand and be wrong. <laughs> I do it all the time. Okay. Uh, I can prove it and, and only use the scriptures and I don't mean the book of Enoch. Amen. Uh, I read the book of Enoch years ago and uh, I thought, boy, this is an amazing book. I... Man, this ought to, this really, man, I think, I don't know, it could be in the, should be in the Bible. And, and um, then God showed me later on that it shouldn't be. And I agreed with God. God, yeah, yeah, why was I thinking that? But it shouldn't, it shouldn't be in the Word of God. And, and then when I, I got around some people, I wasn't really joining with them. I just was listening to them. And they were talking about how the, Book of Enoch probably ought to be in the Bible and, you know, these evil men, they just didn't want it in there and all this stuff. And I'm going, you know what? If God wanted it in there, it would have been in there by now. Surely God would have put it in there by now. But they don't understand that and they just, uh, uh, they, they just think man's made a mistake. But um, uh, I, one of the things that I kept hearing them talk about was, in the book of Enoch, all these messianic prophecies, prophecies about the Messiah coming. And I started listening to them, and I, I was saying to myself, you know, Mike, if, if, there, if there are alleged prophecies concerning the Messiah in the book of Enoch, and the book of Enoch is wrong and should not be in the Bible, then what does that tell you about those prophecies in the book of Enoch? They're not, they're not giving you prophecies on the right Messiah. They're giving you prophecies on a false Messiah. And I think that there's enough people out there who have listened to that garbage that when some of these, and I think some of these prophecies, I don't know what they are, but I think some of them are likely to come to pass. And when they do, people are going to go, see, that's, that was in the book of Enoch. That should have been in the Bible all along. And boom, there they go. 
There they go. They're already chasing away what Paul said, though we or an angel from heaven bring you any other gospel, let him be accursed. And I guess a messianic prophecy would count as another gospel because they're following the wrong Jesus, the wrong Savior, with the wrong gospel, with the wrong spirit. So anyway, uh, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years. Now, verse 4 is what I want you to look at. There were giants in the earth in those days. Now, in the Hebrew, that word is translated as Giants. Amen. It's giants. No, they use the word Nephilim. In fact, in the NIV, they don't even bother. Who did that? Some schmo. They didn't even bother to transliter or translate the word Nephilim, they transliterated it, which means they took what the Hebrew word said in Hebrew, Nephilim, and they transliterated it, which means they wrote it as they saw it. They didn't translate it. They didn't say this word means such and such. So if you, if you look here, uh, clearly right here, Genesis 6, verse 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. So if all you read is an NIV or a New American Standard or any of these other Bibles, what are you going to know? Well, or let me say this. What is it that you're not going to know about what was in the earth in those days? The giants. You're not going to know that they were there. So you've already missed out on something that I think is important. So the, the, go back to the uh, King James. Back here. Uh, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that, meaning that there were giants in the earth in the days prior to the flood and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So uh, this is, uh, this is, let's see, where I got the picture from. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, the Amazon guy. Yeah, stealing the box off this guy's front porch. Um, notice the, notice the size of the giant compared to the size of the woman next to the sheep. Extremely large people. Now, how big were they? That's a, that's a question. How big were the giants? What's the biggest giant size that we have known to us in the scripture. What, how, how big is that? Tall as, tall as cedars. That's pretty good. If you just happen to know how tall the cedar was. About eight feet. 80? Not bad. Og. Yeah, Og. Og. His, uh, his bed was of, uh, of iron, and it was how many cubits? Who knows how that, huh? 13 cubits? Yeah, I think it comes out to 13 feet. I think it was like 9 cubits or something like that. Somebody look that up. Look up the word og in your King James Pure Bible Search software that you have. Um, anyway, look that up and find out how big his bed was. That'll give you some 
some sort of idea of, of how big he was. Uh, he, wouldn't have, uh, he wouldn't have slept in a little dinky bed. I guess you could understand that. Nine cubits, that's what I thought. And how many, so depending on your cubit, mine's 18 inches. Huh? 13 and a half feet. That's roughly, if, if you were using my cubit, and my cubit is the right cubit. If you're using mine, it would be about 13 and a half feet, something like that. That's a big fella. That's not just somebody that's tall that you give the basketball to and he just drops it in there. Okay? He's big. His girth is big. His body is big. His shoulders and his, uh, the, just the way he carries himself are, is big. Now, uh, it's very possible uh, if we go to Numbers chapter 13, turn there. It's very, very possible that the giants in some of those places could have been much, much taller than that. Numbers chapter 13, this is when Moses sent them in to the land to, to uh, survey out the land. I think that's pretty neat. Moses goes in and says, hey, I hear these guys are like humongous. And all it takes is just one bite and they've eaten half a person already. Why don't about 12 of you guys go in there and find out if that's true? I'll just be sitting back here writing the Bible while you guys are out there doing that. Now go do it and come back before dinner, all right? Um, anyway, we have... Um, Oh, uh, let's see here. I'm looking at uh, number 13. I'm looking at verse uh, 27. And they told him, they said, We came unto the land where thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. Talking about that, that uh, cluster of grapes uh, uh, that was carried by two men on a big pole. Uh, verse 28, Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. Excuse me. And the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And the Amalekites uh, dwell in the land uh, of the south and of the Hittites. And the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people mo uh, before Moses and said, let us go up. At once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. That is a, a, if I were to preach a message on that tonight, I would preach a message to you of saying, never mind the giants. Go with God. Amen. Never mind the giants. My God is bigger than all the giants put together. He's the one that made the giants. He's the one that can unmake the giants. Uh, read, read, read what he says uh, in Job about Leviathan and about how big he is and Behemoth and about how big he is. And, and he says, God can make these things. God can unmake these things. He can make them disappear if he wants to. So why don't we trust that God that can do all of these things? Things. If there's one thing that I've learned in my 58 years of tra uh, travailing and traveling and traversing in this life, it is that God is bigger than all of my problems put together. Somebody say amen. And that's why these stories are there for us in the Bible to tell us that it doesn't matter how big your problem is. Doesn't matter how, how vicious the enemies that you have are against you. God has brought them about and God can get rid of them when he wants to. And I promise you, you put your trust in him, you won't worry about the giants and you won't worry about the Leviathans and you won't worry about the behemoths. Somebody say amen. Listen, I've tackled behemoths before and Leviathans 
and giants before, just in different names. But I've tackled them all in my life, and I'm here to tell you <coughs> that God is bigger than every one of them. Amen? All right, now, uh, so let's go to verse uh, 4. Well, we're already there. For there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. And so here, here's now where these giants come from. So let's take just a little bit of time and deal with this uh, because you're going to be one of two people. You're either going to say, well, I believe the Bible, but, or you're going to say, I just believe the Bible, and that's it. And what I mean by that is, you could be, I, I believe the Bible, but the story of those dragons and those giants, unicorns, come on, really? Unicorns in the Bible? I mean, that's kind of, it's kind of embarrassing when you're talking to people and they bring up to you, what, you believe in the book with, with giants and fairy tales and unicorns, really? That's the book you believe in? Study those things out. Study them out. Don't just hear somebody mock them and make fun of them and have them destroy your faith in the only book that we declare in this world, the only book that's right 100% of the time. Uh, study these things out. I promise you, You'll get a blessing from those. You'll, you'll, you'll get understanding. And you'll believe that there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. You'll believe that God's strength is as the strength of a unicorn. And then you'll study and you'll believe and you'll understand and you'll know what a unicorn he's talking about in here. You'll know these things. You'll understand about dragons. You'll understand about ghosts. You'll understand about uh, just different appearances of different things that the Bible talks about. Uh, and you'll believe what the Bible says. Anyway, back to uh, Genesis 6. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. Meaning before the flood, after the flood. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. Who were the sons of God? Who were the daughters of men? And they bare children unto them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And when the Bible talks about that, the Bible is telling us, look at history. Look around at the stories. Look at what the Greeks tell. Look at the story that the Romans told about the Titans. Um, look at the stories that... Uh, ancient man and, and the tribes of earth, the stories that they told of their ancient fathers and how they dealt with men of great stature. These were humongous human beings or humongous people that uh, in many cases they were very ferocious type beings. Some of the stories that we've heard uh, tell us that uh, some of these giants, basically that they were eaters of human flesh, that they literally would take and eat a human being. They would eat them, just take them and just eat them right in front of you. And, um, and so some people would, might have a problem with that, Unless you start understanding the Bible and what it means, what is a, what, what, who are these sons of God? Who are these daughters of men? Well, I'll tell you what, let's, um, I'm going to break away from my notes here in a little bit. Is that all right? That just makes the whole sermon just go a lot longer. So first of all, let's do this. And this is, what I, this is why I want to encourage you. It ain't, it ain't up there, is it? Let me make a little. 
quick little uh, issue here. Let's see, you see that, don't you? You don't know what I'm saying, though, do you? Um, display settings. Let me share this. Uh, da, 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 show only on one. Duplicate these displays. Looky there. Keep changes, right? You saw that, right? Yeah, you saw it, hush. All right. This is, what I, this is how I like to study. This is what I like to do. So I'm just going to type in that phrase, sons of God. Or if I was Irish, it would be sons of God. Okay? Now I'm going to look at every place in the Bible where that phrase is used. And we're going to find out then what the Bible tells us the sons of God are. Genesis 6, 2, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. Okay, so that's one verse. It doesn't really give us a lot of clues, but let's keep going. Down in verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God, there it says it again exactly the same way, the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Now, so now we have like a, uh, we, have, we have sort of a, a, a clue here into the ancient past. It's telling us that these sons of God and the children that were born to them became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. In other words, their stories are told everywhere. Their stories are told of, of maybe of, of large men that when they came into town to uh, steal some... Uh, Steal some sheep or steal some cattle. Maybe some of the people tried to fight, but they, they weren't successful because of these guys and, and their, their height, okay? So we have the sons of God coming into the daughters of men. They bear children to them. These children became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Job chapter 1. Now there was a day. Now this gives us a little bit more of an interesting clue. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? And he's going to talk about Job for a while and so on and so on. And so here we have this idea that Satan uh, is among who we would call the sons of God. In other words, sounds to me like he's an angel. Job chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Uh, and the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? Again, we're having the same conversation here. Now, now we have a, a different clue, a little bit better clue. It's in Job 38, 7. If you want to turn your Bible there. Job 38, 7. Let's start in verse 5. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? And, and what God is doing is God is, is giving us sort of a, a test to Job, knowing that Job is going to get all the answers wrong. Okay? 
because he wants to understand he wants Job to understand just how mighty God is and our God is a mighty God amen oh I can still remember going to Kenya the first time and I can hear those men uh, singing in their church I can hear them all the way down the road what a mighty God we serve what a mighty God we serve and I'm going I recognize that song I like it so anyway verse 6 whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened or who laid the cornerstone thereof in other words who laid the cornerstone of the earth well God did verse 7 when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now we got a clue here. The morning stars all sang together all at once along with the sons of God and they all shouted for joy. So now we have a clue. We, it looks like we've got the sons of God mentioned in the same verse in the same breath. As the, um, uh, as the morning stars. And stars are always angels in the Bible. Always angels. Always. Okay? Uh, now, we have, um, we're going to change it up just a little bit. Turn to Psalm 82. Psalm 82. We're not going to see the phrase sons of God. We're going to see the phrase a little bit different. But it's going to be close to the same thing. Psalm 82. Oh, yeah, Jesus quoted this verse. Did you know that? Jesus quoted this verse, starting in verse 6. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. So what does that mean? Huh? They're sons of God. They are all children of the Most High, meaning that they are sons of God. I have said, ye are gods, all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Now this verse directly applies to Lucifer. We know that Lucifer is going to ascend to heaven. Uh, he's also going to fall fall back down too okay uh, and he's not going to enjoy it. this is a this is a uh, an amusement park ride that he's not going to enjoy very well how many of you remember the day when you went to an amusement park and got on a ride and said oh no i'm too old to get on these things yeah I never forget that as long as I live. I thought, man, I'm going to blow on this thing just as sure as the world. Kids all around me, I'm going to puke all on them, man. And God, God let me withhold. And my wife said, you look white as a ghost. Well, I was about ready to blow too, man. I ain't kidding you. All right. So we, we have the same phrase. It's in a little bit different fashion. But children of the Most High are sons of God and the children of the Most High are gods with a little g okay so it's, the Bible ties it all together if we look at sons of God in the New Testament oh I like this in the New Testament in John chapter 1 but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. So right there, we have salvation by grace through faith. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God. 
we're going to be just like the angels in heaven. Isn't that what Jesus said about us? They shall be as the angels, okay? So uh, Romans 8, 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons, O God. All right? Verse 19, same chapter, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. When, when, now, and excuse me, but I just see this brother, he's walking back, he's got crutches, okay? You're not going to have those forever. I don't mean to embarrass you. I just want a little praise the Lord time. Amen? Amen. None of us are going to have the things that ail our body, the things that make us sick, the things that make us weak, things that make us human. And I'm one of them, okay? We're not going to have those things anymore. We're going to, we're going to be exalted. We're waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Philippians 2.15 that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of the crooked and perverse na nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. What do stars do? Shine as lights in the world, don't they? So what are we going to do? Shine as lights in the world. 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when, we shall, uh, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Oh, don't ever get over that, people. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, let's, let's, uh, let's take a little look-see here at what... There we go. At how... Um, the encyclopedias, how they refer to the giants, uh, that comes from the word gigantes uh, in Greek and Roman mythology. The giants are also called gigantes, and that comes from the Greek word gigantes. Uh, we're, we're a race of great strength and aggression, though not necessarily of great size on you okay what else would it mean okay they're not just good at basketball amen they're good at eating people amen so they were known for the uh, gigantomachy or gigantomachia their battle with the Olympian gods. According to Hesiod, the giants were the offspring of Gaia, the earth, um, born from the blood that fell when Oranos, I never call it the other word. I never do. That is the uh, Greek version of it. The Latin version is Oranos. Okay? So... Um, he was, uh, he was born from the blood that fell when Oranos, the sky god, was castrated by his uh, titan son, Cronus. Uh, archaic and classical representation, representations show Gigantes as man-sized, uh, hopolites, uh, heavily armed ancient Greek foot soldiers, fully human in form. Later representations after 380 B.C. show Gigantes with snakes for legs. In later traditions, the, uh, the giants were often confused with other opponents after the, uh, of the Olympians, particularly the Titans, 
an earlier generation of large and powerful children of Gaia and Oranos. The vanquished giants were said to be uh, buried under volcanoes and to be the cause of volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. Uh, let me move on here. Uh, it says their origins simply mean earthborn. Gigantes, from the word Gaia, I guess, is where they're getting that from. Uh, and Hesiod's Theogony makes this explicit by having the giants be the offspring of Gaia. Uh, and according to Hesiod, Greek mating with Oranos, uh, before many children, or bore many children, uh, the first generation of Titans, the Cyclops, and the hundred handers, however, Oranos hated his own children, and as soon as they were born, he imprisoned them inside Gaia, causing her much distress. Therefore, Gaia made a sickle of adamant, which she gave to Cronus, the youngest of her titan sons, and hid him, presumably still inside Gaia's body, to wait in ambush. And I'm not going to read the rest of that, but it's absolutely ridiculous. They, they've taken uh, the, whole, the whole mythology. Uh, I mean, if you're going to have a myth, you, you have a big myth. Amen? You have a huge one. And they've even taken the mythology of the gigantes, or the giants, and made them down to human size and just said they were strong. They were muscular, but they were just normal size. People don't, just, I mean, that's, you're, I'm, I'm not telling you to believe Greek or Roman mythology. I'm telling you to believe what the Bible says. And when the Bible says that Goliath was um, six cubits and a span, you can believe that. You can take it to the bank. That's how big he was. Somebody give us an amen about that one, all right? So now, um, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So let me ask you a question. If I were to... If I were to be up here teaching and I said that Noah was saved by earning his salvation by works in building the ark to save him, his wife, his three sons, their wives, and all of the animals that went on the ark. If I were to tell you that Noah was saved by his works, what would you say to me? Now, is that all one word, or is that a bunch of words put together? Huh? Hebrews 11? What are you trying to get at there, olive oil? Hebrews 11. I'm setting you up, by the way, for something. So, if I were to ask you, or if I told you that Noah was saved by works, You, so you're saying he believed God? Huh? Did Noah believe God? Before or after it started raining? Yeah, both. <laughs> dip, 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 dip. Okay. 
So would you say that Noah was saved by grace through faith? Okay. Well, we know that. Okay. But um, how pure? Yeah. Um, Noah and his family were, were pure. They were still, they had the same DNA as Adam did. Okay, I get that. But as far as, um, as far as them being able to go to heaven, were they going to heaven by grace or by works? Okay. Um, believe it or not, you're in a minority. You're in a minority. You're in a good minority, but you're in a minority. Um, there's some, some of them are well-meaning, and I would not, I would not, I, I have a policy that if I know that uh, somebody or a group or a church or whatever, if I know that they really, really do stand on the King James and believe it with all their heart, I, I just, my policy is I don't go after them. I don't, I don't try to run them down in front of people. I don't call them out for being heretics or anything like that. Uh, we're all wrong about something, okay? Um, but anyway, the doctrine of dispensationalism, you've heard me use that word before, uh, hyper-dispensationalism is worse than that, very far worse than that. But they believe in multiple, multiple um, gospels for different dispensations that people lived in. One of them was the, the, the Noah dispensation that Noah and his family was saved by their works in building the ark. And that that's what saved them was their building of the ark. Would you agree with that? Why wouldn't you agree with that? Do what? That's a good way of putting it. Okay. Yes, sir. I think there was a very specific reason why God started that whole section very simply by saying, and Noah found grace. There you go. That's all you have to say right there is Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Did he find that grace? Before he started making nails or after he started making nails? Before he had, he found, and I like this phrase. He found grace because he was looking for it. That's what I believe. He was looking for grace because he knew what kind of sinner he was. And he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He had, and he had to have. And uh, so that, but like I said, there are people, and I, again, I wouldn't name any names. Uh, I just wouldn't do that. Um, of some people that believe that uh, Noah worked his way to salvation. He received salvation by the works that he did of building the ark, and the ark saved him my and my immediate response to that would be exactly what you said but it said no wait a minute wait a minute it says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and it said that in Genesis 6 verse 8 before it says anything else about okay Noah I need you to build this it's got to be this long this high this deep and you need to do it this way and so on and so on uh, the Bible is very, very clear 
that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, period. And so Noah is in heaven now, him and Mrs. Noah, and the three Noah sons, and the three little Mrs. Noah sons, and, and uh, they're all in heaven now because of grace. They believed the way their father believed. Noah b believed what God said. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and that grace is what, is what propelled him to build the ark to begin with. When you go back to um, the book of James and you're looking at are we saved by uh, faith or are we saved uh, by grace, you know, which is it? Well, uh, James puts it down as yes. Hebrews, James, here we go. Turn to, turn to the book of James, if you would. Um, let's see here, where can we pick it up? How about our, uh, how about... Um, Verse 15 of James chapter 2. If her brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say uh, unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful uh, to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you thee my faith by my works. And I think it's clear that if you really believe something, you'll perform that which you believe. If Noah really believed, that building the ark was what's what was going to save him, his family, and all the, the seed of the earth. If he really believed that, then he starts building one. If he doesn't really believe that, he doesn't build one. It's that simple. And to me, it is pretty simple. Um, verse 19, thou believest that there is one God, that de thou doest well, the devils also believe, and... Tremble, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Uh, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered um, Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith without, uh, without um, wrought, excuse me, wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, for he was called the friend of God. My brothers and sisters, if I, if I live long enough to have a headstone, I would want it written on there, he was a friend of God. Amen. So he says, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had uh, received this, the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So they all work hand in hand, all right? All right, now, let's see here. Let's, let's walk down the little path here. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth was also corrupt before God. Uh, now, the, where I was going tonight was going to talk about hybrids. And what a hybrid is and, and what it's... 
what it's going to be like in the world that we live in now. Uh, the earth was corrupt before God means that it wasn't, it wasn't built the way God originally built it. Anytime man gets involved in something like the, like the handiwork of God, man's going to corrupt it. Man's not going to, man, man right now, fooling with human DNA, I promise you, is not going to make humans better. And let me tell you where all this... Um, here we go with the weird stuff now. Let me tell you where, but they say, that's where we like it, Brother Mike. Where all this DNA corruption with humans is, is really coming from. Um, a man by the name of Dr. John Mack, Harvard, head of the Harvard uh, Psychiatric Department, uh, world-renowned psychiatrist, um, very, very smart, intelligent man. Um, you, don't, you don't get to be head of the psychiatric department of Harvard University uh, simply because you scored more points in a poker game than the other guy did, okay? You get that way because you've earned it. He was a Pulitzer Prize winning author uh, and very, very intelligent man. Uh, he got involved with a man by the name of Bud Hopkins. Bud Hopkins um, was uh, someone, he was an artist, and he also um, started hearing people talk about how they had missing time in their sleep. And so uh, Bud Hopkins would uh, make preparations, lay them down in his couch, and put them under hypnotic regression, and he would begin to um, cause them to go into a hypnotic state and he would start getting from them information about where they were on a particular night, what was happening to them on this particular night, um, what was, who, who was behind it, what was being said, how was it being said, and so on and so on. A lot of things. He started hearing uh, I don't know, hundreds of different patients were coming to him and they were all telling almost to the letter the exact same story. That they were being uh, drawn up into the air, sometimes through the wall, sometimes through the roof. They could feel their body going up through the, the roof layers, the drywall, the insulation, the, um, the, the tar on the roof of the building, the apartment building in New York City. They could feel that. They could feel themselves going into this big saucer-shaped machine. Um, and they all had the sense that there was medical experiments being done on them. They all told the story that uh, different instruments were used, that uh, the people that were doing it were no taller than about four feet, something like that. All of them had very large oversized heads, they had almost no mouth, just a very, very tiny mouth. They had big almond-shaped eyes, black eyes. And um, 
then um, they would do certain, like I said, they would do certain experiments on them. If it was a woman, then they extracted eggs from them. If it was a man, they extracted seed from this man. Um, they did other seemingly nonsensical experiments. In other words, they don't know why they did them. Uh, but they said in just about every case, they were only interested in one thing only. And that was uh, the taking of the eggs and the seed from the male and the female, in some cases, the women would be shown a child and the whatever alien it was would point to the woman and then point to the child and point back to the woman. As if to say, this is yours. Uh, if there was any contact made, it was always done telepathically. Now, this is, this is uh, like I say, this is Bud Hopkins. He is just a, he's a New York artist and doesn't really have much in the way of credentials. But he gets John Mack involved. And John, John Mack is like, I've never heard of this. I'm going to look into this. So here is this Harvard credentialed psychiatrist. And he's interested to see if it's possible that there are any signs of uh, any kind of psychosis, any kind of... Uh, you know, something maybe that's wrong with their, with their brain. Uh, maybe they all have uh, a, a, a disease of some kind, a psychiatric disease of some kind. And he's looking at it from that direction. And he does about 100 different regressions. And out of those 100 regressions, he cannot find any evidence whatsoever of them, of any, any of the subjects having, and he can't, in other words, he can't find out, they're not crazy. They're not nuts. They don't have, um, you know, some kind of space disease, okay? Nothing like that. These are all normal people who go about their lives every day they live their lives, they come home, they cook supper, they eat supper, they read books, they watch TV, they go to bed, they get up and do the same thing the next day. He said they just live normal lives, but they have all of this missing time right in the middle of the night. They have absolutely no control over it whatsoever. And he said in some cases, in fact more than a few cases, he finds out that these people oftentimes had this done to them while they were 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 years old. In every case, if they were too young, the aliens, I guess you could call them, would wait until puberty. Once puberty took place, then the experiments begin just like with the other ones. Okay? Now, the whole purpose of this, Bud Hopkins and Dr. John Mack agreeing 100%. The whole purpose was to create a hybrid species on this earth, on this planet. Now, they would not reveal why they did it or why they were doing it, 
or if they did reveal it, uh, they got the sense that they were lying about it because their stories sometimes didn't match. They weren't the same story. And so they detected that there was some form of, of uh, lying going on or misrepresentation going on. They're not telling them exactly why they're wanting to do this. They're just, they just know that the stories don't match and that they are lying through their teeth about this. Okay? Now, I, uh, I always, always, always go to the Scriptures for everything that I believe. I have it up here um, in verse 12. God looked upon the earth and behold it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. When we look back here um, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, they bare children unto them. The same became mighty men of old, uh, which were of old, men of renown. So what you have here, is you have the exact same thing going on. You have hybridization. Hybridization. You have one race that is creating an entirely different race of species on planet Earth, okay? Uh, the cause of which uh, I've not really found yet in the scriptures, but I believe that the answer is in the scriptures. How about you? That's what I believe. Now, am I crazy for this? No, I, I don't believe I am. Um, let's see here. All flesh and corrupted his way. Deuteronomy. I don't want to read that. Turn to Genesis 14. We got a bunch of them here. A bunch of hybrids. Now, let, let's... Let me ask you this question. This, this would be a deep theological question for you. Um, and obviously I don't believe this because this, you know, half my family is black, so I, I'm, I wouldn't, wouldn't believe this for a moment, okay? But let's say that, um, let's say the Bible said that all of my white grandchildren have no souls whatsoever and they can't go to heaven. But my black grandchildren, they've got souls and they can go to heaven. Right, Michaela? All right. So, what would happen if a black person who in this illustration has a soul joins with a white person who in this illustration has no soul and they get married, and they have a child. Does that child have a soul, and can it go to heaven? Now, I'm not asking you in real life, so don't say, yeah, but you see what I'm getting at. Would, would they have a soul? Would they be able to go to heaven? I wasn't asking really for you to answer. I just. Hey, no, that's fine. Go ahead. This is. 
poor cheeseburger, he's not going to heaven. Yeah. Hmm? Only half. Yeah. Which half? Top half, bottom half, right half, left half? Okay. That's a pretty good answer. So let's take this now. And we have, um, let's say that we have a, uh, an alien. They're, and, the, and the phrase alien is biblically correct. They are not inhabitants of this world. They were not born here. They're not from here. And uh, so they 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 do not they do not belong here. Okay, they are alien in every sense of the word. And when you see the Bible using that term, that term is correctly applied to them. Okay. Um, uh, let's see here. That's not really a good place. You know what? Turn to turn to uh, Daniel chapter two. Because that really is the, the, the place that gives us the story of that happening in prophecy. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 is, of course, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He has a dream, but he doesn't know what it is. And he asks all of his uh, soothsayers, tell me what my dream was and uh, I'll, all, I'll, I'll buy you dinner. And of course they uh, fumble around and they can't figure out what it is and they're about to freak out and they're going to make something up and and the king says, okay, now tell me what it was, but if, if, but if you lie to me, I'll know it, and if you uh, don't tell me the truth, then I'm going to kill all of you. So anyway, in uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse 36, this is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof uh, before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And whosoever, or wheresoever, the children of men dwell, the beast uh, of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given unto thine hand, and uh, hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Uh, verse 39, And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall uh, bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron um, that breaketh all, all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of irons or part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of, the, of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Oh, I can't wait for that one. Amen. That's Christ's kingdom, and the kingdom shall not be left to an, uh, other people, 
but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver and the gold, the, um, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter and the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. So we have back in verse uh, 40, uh, 43, whereas thou sowest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another. So iron mixed to clay. It just doesn't work, does it? Doesn't stick. They won't hold to each other. They don't hold fast to each other. Um, you can't weld iron with miry clay. You just can't do it. There's just no possible way to do it. So it, it, it seems to me that Oh, and, and there's something I want to do, too. This is, uh, this is interesting. I've had, um, I've had one, of my, one of my girls, Christina, my niece, bless her heart, she's been working on typing up all of the differences between the 1973... New International Version of the Bible and the current inter New International Version of the Bible. They're not the same. They're not the same. So all these people who say to you, oh yeah, well which King James Bible do you believe in? Because they've all been changed since the... I, I would, I would carry one around in my pocket and say, show me which, which part has been changed. And then, oh, by the way, I happen to have this booklet that Mike Hoggard put out, and it shows all the differences between the 1973 NIV and the 2020 version of the NIV. And if you want more, I've got all the differences between the 1995 New American Standard version of the Bible versus the 2020 Standard Version of the Bible, New American Standard Bible. They've changed literally something in every single verse. It's not the same Bible. But the King James is. Same Bible. Amen. A um, bunch of liars. Anyway, uh, I do. I want to show you this. Uh, we're going to go uh, to. Uh, it does, does it again, doesn't it? I need to close this out. There we go. Um, there we go. I want to show you Daniel. Forty-three, and just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, it's not the same. So the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. Is that even close to what the King James says? Okay, let's try the. Um, Let's try the English Standard Version. Same verse. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. Is that? No, that's not, that doesn't work either. The Christian Standard Bible, which is the uh, Southern Baptist Bible. You saw the iron mixed with clay, the peoples will mix with one another, but will not hold together just as iron does not mix with fired clay. 
What happened to the fire? What happened to the clay? It got fired. New American Standard Version of 2020. In that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in their descendants, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not combine with, pot with uh, pottery. And it doesn't matter what version you pick, you're not even close to what the King James says. What you've got then is that you've got, in my opinion, the devil is trying to cover something up. He does not want you to see what really is going to happen. That they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Amen, amen. All right. Uh, let, me, let me read off a couple of these questions real quick. I know y'all are getting tired. So... Tomorrow morning, show up and we'll give you some donuts and sugar. That ought to help you. That's my boy. Um, is the beast in Revelation 13 literal or symbolic? Who wants to answer that? Who wants me to answer it? <laughs> No, go ahead, brother. He is a beast, but he's also a beast. Okay? Um, and this is something that God helped me with um, many years ago, was to, to, to begin to accept the words that I was reading to be literally the words that he meant. And, um, and so a beast in the Bible can, can be a, uh, uh, it can be a spirit beast, okay? Uh, and I believe that this beast in Revelation 13 is a spirit beast, just like the dragon is, the serpent. He is a beast in every way, but he is also real. Okay, but beasts in the Bible carry with them a symbolism. And in that symbolism, like when you have beasts that are principalities, a lot of times you'll see them in the flags of various countries. They'll have a, they'll have a beast on their flag or on their, uh, as an emblem of their country or something like that. Well, I think sometimes that indicates the very spirit, the principality, beast that rules over that particular city or that particular state or that particular country. Okay? Uh, are there any symbolic creatures in the book of Revelation? Uh, I would say yes. Uh, and I would say all of them are. Um, but then again, the same answer applies. I believe that they are literal and real at the same time. People used to ask me years ago when I got started in this, uh, Pastor Mike, do you believe that Barack Obama is the beast? And I'll say, absolutely not 100% for sure. And they said, why? I said, he doesn't have seven heads, ten horns. <laughs> and they would go, yeah, seven heads and ten horns. They had no idea what that meant, but they, that's what they... But, I mean, obviously, uh, if he has a spirit ruling over him, and he does, it is going to be a beast spirit that rules over him. Um, are there any symbolic creatures in the book of Revelation? I think we have read that. Uh, what is the covenant in Daniel 9, 27? Is it the same covenant as in Daniel eleven thirty? Let me look at that very quickly. Uh, first of all, let me say this. This. 
Now, that's different than saying that. That. Yeah. Daniel uh, chapter 9 is referring to a covenant um, that supposedly the Antichrist makes a covenant with Israel for seven years, supposedly. Okay? Uh, I personally do not hold to that. I personally don't. Um, anyway, um, the covenant in Daniel 9.27. Where is we? Right here. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst, and I personally do not believe that these are weeks of, of years either. Okay? That puts me uh, way out in left field, right by the foul pole. Okay? You can't get any farther out and still be playing the game than where I'm at on this. But I. I just, I just one day decided for some reason that I just, I don't know, I just don't see that as being weeks of seven years. I just don't see it that way. And that has, when I say that to people, they're going, how can you not? What is wrong with you? Are you crazy? You how can, it says it right now. No, it doesn't say it anywhere. It doesn't say it. So that's kind of my thing there. What is the covenant in Daniel 9, 27? It's, it's uh, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Um, it's, I think it's possible, possible. I don't know this for sure. I think it's possible that it's the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31. Okay. You can write that down and look it up later. Uh, is it the same one in Daniel 11.30? Uh, Daniel 11.30. Come on, Daniel 11.30. Let's go, baby, come on. People want to go home. Daniel 11.30. For the ships of... Chittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do, he shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. I'm going to be honest with you. Anything after Daniel 7, I'm completely lost in. I think that's part of the book of Daniel that is sealed. And I do not believe that it is unsealed yet. And um, so I do not have very much understanding at all of at least the last half of the book of Daniel. I really don't. It's very, very difficult for me to understand. And so I'm just going to wait for God to do what God's going to do. Uh, how, should, how should we respond to... Preterist argumentation that claims this generation in Matthew 24, 34 is about the first century A.D. Uh, Christians and Jews. Matthew 24, 34. Turn there. Matthew 24. Almost done here. Matthew 24. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. How should we respond to Predator's argumentation uh, that claims this generation in Matthew? Okay, they shall deceive the very elect. Um, is about the first century A.D. Christians and Jews. Huh? 
Oh, 24, 20, okay, 34. I was reading 24, and I'm going, that's why it doesn't make sense. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Um, yeah. Okay. He shall send his angels with the great sound of trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven uh, to the other. And now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves. Know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Um, I'd say it hadn't happened yet. Yeah, I, to me, I would. I, I'll look at it a little bit later tonight. I'd say, I'd say that hasn't happened yet. And if it hasn't happened yet, generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. A generation, by the way, in my personal opinion, uh, has very little to do with. Some say a generation is 40 years. Some say, it, no, no, you're wrong. It's 70 years. No, 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 you guys are all wrong. A generation is 120 years, and that's how the Bible puts it. I'd say a generation is the generation of a people who are born, and they live, and then they've been generated for that day. That's my thinking, all right? All right, huh? I would agree with that. I would agree with that. I really would. So thank you for bringing that up. All right. Donuts. 8.30 in the morning. Oh, yes. And biscuits and gravy. Let's stand to our feet. Thank you all very much for coming. Oh, and don't forget, we haven't, we haven't done anything with it yet, but we have a family Bible to give away this weekend. And uh, so uh, I'm going to see if one of the girls can get something fixed up. Everybody get a number and, or a ticket or something like that. And um, y'all pray for me because my legs are going to be very, very stiff tonight. And I have a lot a lot of uh, of cramp in my lower calves down into the arches of my feet and so on and um, it creates a, a pretty rough night sometimes so pray for me uh, pray for me anyway uh, I am not exempt uh, from the devil just beating the daylights out of me and uh, he's tried to do that today, okay? So just pray for me and pray for our church. And boy, I'm glad to see you all here. Looks like we got a lot of folks here. Who, who's here for the very first time for homecoming? Yeah, I like you guys. I appreciate it. I really do. And uh, so you all have a good night's sleep, and we'll see you in the morning. Father, we love you. And Father, I thank you, God, for loving us. Your love for us, God, I, I, is so, so deep. And it's so merciful and it's so good. Father, we just ask God that you uh, bless each and every one of us tonight. Help us to get a good night's sleep. Lord, help us to, to, uh, to be in the word tonight, to be praying, Lord, for one another. 
And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you'd give us a refreshing evening, give us rest tonight, and Lord, prepare us for the day that comes. Lord, we love you. There's so many things about this Bible that we just don't know. I pray, God, please encourage us to read it just a little bit more and get a blessing out of it. We pray this in Jesus' name and amen.